Good morning. My name is Jen Stallings, and I am pastor for worship here at Glenmar United Methodist Church. And I am also the oldest of three. I am an INFP on the Myers-Briggs. I'm a vegetarian. I'm a college basketball fan. If you didn't pick up on that in Pastor Matt's message last week. I am a lover of the outdoors. And I am forever changed by the months I spent teaching a group of sixth graders in rural Uganda who in so many ways became my teachers. And I am a child of the living God. Now in the same way that I just let you know a little bit about myself, Jesus reveals parts of who he is throughout the Gospel of John in a series of statements beginning with the words, I am. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of them. We just heard some in the anthem here. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower, or I am the vine, you are the branches. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. And throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus also is revealing himself in another way as well, not only through these statements beginning with I am, but also through a series of eight miracles, beginning with the wedding feast at Cana when he turned water into wine and culminating with the eighth miracle here in John chapter 11 with the raising of Lazarus. So we find ourselves this morning situated right in the center chapter of John's Gospel where Jesus is both telling us and showing us the core of who he is and what he's come to do. So we pick up the story right when Jesus arrives at Bethany, and he finds that his friend Lazarus has already been dead for several days. Lazarus' sister Martha leaves her place of mourning, and she comes out to meet her Lord. And when she finds him, she says, If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only, if only you had been here. You see, in, in the first part of the chapter, we learned that Martha and her sister Mary had sent for Jesus way back when Lazarus was sick because they believed that if only Jesus would come, surely Lazarus could be healed. But Jesus stayed where he was for two more days, and by the time he arrived back in Judea, the opportunity for another miraculous healing had long passed. You can imagine the disappointment that Martha and Mary must have felt, how their hopes must have disintegrated as they watched their brother take his last breath. But even so, in the midst of all of her sadness, in the midst of all her grief, Martha shows signs of faith. And when Jesus says, your brother will rise again, Martha says, well, of course he will rise again, because she believed that she, she held the Jewish belief that there would be a bodily resurrection on the last day. And this is where Jesus steps back and reveals a central aspect of his identity, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And just as critical as the statement of self-revelation is the question he asks next when he looks at Martha and says, do you believe this? And Martha's answer is a powerful yes, Lord. And then what she goes on to do is to identify Jesus both as the Messiah and as the Son of God, recognizing in him the power that he shares with the God of Israel. But let's fast forward several verses in chapter 11 to the point when Jesus and Martha come to her brother's tomb. And as they're standing there before the tomb and Jesus says, take away the stone, Martha protests and she says, but Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. And the point she's making here is, is actually not about the stench, but it's the phrase four days that's key. We hear it more than once in chapter 11. And that's because in the time of Jesus, there was a popular Jewish belief that a person's soul would hover around the body for three days after death, 
hoping for the opportunity to enter back in. But after three days, the soul would leave the body for good. And so what Martha is really doing here is underscoring the stark reality of death. Lazarus, he's really dead. Why would you take away the stone? So next to the tomb, when she is confronted with the seeming finality of death, Martha struggles to make the same affirmation of faith that she had made just moments earlier. And I'd venture to say that a lot of us are like Martha, which is why I think it's important that the church preach about Jesus as the resurrection and the life in all times and in all seasons, and not just at funerals, which is when we're typically accustomed to hearing it, when the sense of loss is so acute and our grief is so strong. And this is the point in the story when Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And by the glory of God, he's not just referring to the miracle that is about to take place, but he's pointing ahead toward his own death and resurrection at the time when he's going to defeat death forever. So as they remove the stone and Jesus cries, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man rises and comes out of the grave. We see in this story what Martha couldn't yet comprehend, and that is that Jesus is Lord even over death. Do you believe this? Jesus' question is not just meant for Martha. It's meant for the readers and the hearers of John's gospel as well. And do we believe it? Do we really believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Now, after Jesus identifies himself as the resurrection and the life, he makes two promises to those who believe in him. And the first one is that those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Our future, Jesus is saying, our future is not determined by death. Death doesn't have the final word in human existence. It's not the ultimate reality. But do we believe it? And I'll be honest, and I, I think that our culture makes it very, very difficult to believe it. We have become so good at preserving life um, whether it's through the resources that we pour into national defense or the latest technologies that, we, that we've developed in our hospitals or the gates that we have to drive through to get into some of our communities or the security alarms that we arm on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm not saying that these things are bad, but what I think can happen is that they can give us the impression that death is final, that this is it, and what ends up happening is that we end up trusting in these things that are meant to protect and preserve life rather than trusting in the one who is the resurrection and the life. And I'll tell you the other thing that I think in our culture makes it difficult to believe that death is not final, and that's this mentality that, um, that you only live once. And I think the necessary corollary of so you only live once is so live it up. And culture, our culture is, is sending us these messages that this is it, and what we need to do is to get the house, get the car, get the family, get the, get the job that we've always wanted. And so we are, without knowing it or not, we are pushed towards this goal of upward mobility that then ends up driving our day-to-day -day existence. I don't know, some of you may, have, may know the story of Alan Tibbles. Actually, some of you may have even known Alan Tibbles. But he is a person, I think, who embodies a belief that death is not final and a trust in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Now, in 1978, Alan, a 23-year-old Alan at that point, wrote in his journal, my life is yours. I want to forsake all for you. I don't know what this will mean, but I make this my sincere promise. Take all I have to offer. It is yours. So in 1986, when Alan felt that God was calling him to relocate to Baltimore City to be the presence of Christ in a hurting area, he took his wife and his two children, and they moved from their comfortable home on 11 acres out in Clarksville into a burned-out shell of a house in the 15-square-block community of Sandtown, Sandtown, Winchester in Baltimore. And this was the 1980s. So the 1980s in Baltimore, we saw the height of the crack epidemic. And so in Sandtown, just like in other areas, 
Sand Town was plagued by violence, and at the time that Alan and his family moved in, there were over 350 abandoned homes. One of my friends who grew up and actually still lives in Sandtown tells me this story about one time when Alan was home in the middle of the night and two young men broke into his house. And one of the young men went up into his bedroom and held a knife to his neck while this other young man went through the house looking for things to steal. And as the blade of the knife was to his neck, Alan just looked up at this young man and said, why are you doing this? Don't you know that I love you guys? And the young man's response is, is funny. He says, y'all either must be crazy or religious. <laughs> and so they left. They left his house and they didn't hurt him. And the only thing they took with them was a VCR. And another friend of mine who lived for a summer in Sandtown told me about a story that Alan had told him about a time when a bullet went through his daughter's bedroom window while she was sleeping. And to a lot of us, this really does sound crazy. To pick up and leave a life of, of comfort, to leave security, and to move into a place that most of us would consider dangerous. But Alan Tipples knew that nothing could happen to him in Sandtown that would ultimately determine his future, because that was already determined by his faith in Christ. Now, when his friend, with his friend Mark and some other members of the Sandtown Winchester neighborhood, they started New Song Church and Urban Ministries, which is still one of the leading signs of hope in Baltimore. And then Alan became the force behind Sandtown Habitat for Humanity. And over the course of 21 years, the community restored and rebuilt almost 300 homes. And I think what makes Alan Tibble's witness even more incredible is the fact that Alan was a quadriplegic, and he had been since 1981 when he was injured in a basketball accident. And you can imagine that after this happening, we, we, we hear his journal entry in 1978 and this promise that he made to the Lord, but after 1981 and this accident, you can imagine a lot of people would have just said, you know, Alan, I think it's okay. I think you should stay where you are. You've been through enough. But his trust in a Lord who is the resurrection and the life is what compelled him and, and what allowed him to make this, this choice to follow him without reserve. And Jesus makes another promise in John chapter 11, and that is that everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So our future is not the only thing determined by our faith in Christ. Our present is also determined by Jesus' power for life, which we experience in the gift of eternal life. And this is freeing. Believing this frees us for faithful witness. It frees us to take risks, to be bold, even to the extent that we might look foolish. It frees us to move to places out of our comfort zones, and I think it also frees us to make the kinds of sacrifices that are sometimes very costly. Now, when I was in Burundi last year, I went for a conference on um, ethnicity, identity, and reconciliation. And I heard the story of Buta Junior Seminary. And a junior seminary in East Africa is actually a school for students in their last two years of high school who are interested in pursuing the priesthood. And during Burundi in the 1990s, um, and also in Rwanda, there were a series of ethnic conflicts and clashes between the Hutu and the Tutsi. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the Rwanda genocide. You might have seen Hotel Rwanda, but I think what a lot of people don't know is that clashes of a similar magnitude also happened in Burundi, which is Rwanda's smaller neighbor to the south. So on the evening of April 30th, 1997, Hutu rebels broke into Buta Junior Seminary and they went straight for a dormitory where the students were sleeping. And some of these students were able to escape through a back window, but 40 of the students remained trapped inside. And the rebels broke into the dormitory, and when they entered, they told the students to separate. The students didn't move. They gave the order to separate three times, and each time the students didn't move, even though the Hutu students, it meant that they could have, if they wanted to, escaped with their lives. But after the third order to separate and the third refusal, the rebels opened fire on the entire group. And the rector of Buta Junior Seminary, who is still the rector there, 
He talks about it, the story of these students, as a sad story, but also a story that carries a lot of light. Because their witness, their refusal to separate, and their conviction of their unity in Christ is and has been a powerful witness, not only to the church in Burundi, but to the entire nation. And so today, if you go to Buta and you visit the seminary, there's a memorial in the back where there is a mural painting, and all 40 students are depicted in this painting, and they are worshiping around the throne of Christ. At the same time while I was in Burundi, I met a woman named Josephine, who is a trauma counselor for World Vision International in Rwanda, and she herself lived through these ethnic conflicts. And after hearing stories like Buta, story after story, one of my classmates just raised, raised her hand and asked, how do you go on after a tragedy like this? What do you do with something like this? And what Josephine said is something that I will never forget. She said, you know, when we look at situations like these, we see only what we can see through our human eyes. But when God looks at us, God looks at us through eternal eyes. God looks at us through eternal eyes. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we are united to him in his death and resurrection so that from our very first earthly breath to our very last, we are held within the embrace of the Alpha and the Omega, the true first and the last, who is the resurrection and the life. Jesus calls Lazarus forth from the tomb and he frees him from the bonds of death to live again. And just like Lazarus, Jesus calls us by name. And he calls us and he frees us from the bonds of death to live a life of faithfulness both here and now and a life eternally with him in the future. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this?